God's grace and his mercy are yours, given to you through the work of Jesus Christ, our one and only Lord, the one who trusted his Father enough to go to the cross on our behalf. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, well, welcome again to the new sermon study that we are doing. We just got done with a sermon study where we got to see Jesus' miracles in a real way. And with that, I hope, I hope that you were able to see yourself in a lot of the one-on-one -on -one individuals that Jesus, uh, Jesus worked with. Um, maybe you sympathized and you knew what the people at the wedding were going through and re they realized that they were out of wine. Maybe it, it struck you when you saw yourself as a sick person and realized that it is only God that heals you. Maybe you sympathized and you uh, recognized the person that was paralyzed that needed faith, and the first thing that Jesus went to him and did was to give him faith. And maybe last week it really hit you when you realized that you're going to be just like that young sixth grade girl who died, but to realize that you have a Savior that has overcome death and can raise back to life as, as quickly and easily as anything else. Those were sort of things that we were able to attach ourselves to individual people in the Bible. Today, in our new sermon study, we are going to be attaching ourselves to a group of people, which we call the Israelites. Now, who are the Israelites? Let's just have a, a little history of who the Israelites are. The Israelites began as God's people, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, those were the grandfathers, great-grandfathers of the Israelite people. Um, when we first hear about the Israelites a lot in the book of Exodus, um, we see that the Israelites were enslaved by the Egyptians. And it was up to Moses, who God plucked out of all of the Israelites, a simple farmer, a simple uh, rancher, a simple herdsman, that God said, I want you to go to the Egyptian pharaoh, and I want you to go up to him and say, let my people go. In a few, in a few weeks, we're going to watch uh, the movie Ten Commandments. You might see that with Charlton Heston. That's what this is account is going on, where he goes up to the Egyptian pharaoh and said, let God's people go. It's estimated that the Israelites at this time, when we're about to, to meet them, um, Scripture has them counted as 600,000 men, just the men. So a good round estimate is that you had about 2.5 million people, million Israelites, all in one spot. Now, the way that the government was is that you had Moses as their leader, and he had two main helpers. The helper for the army, the, the um, military man, that would be Joshua. Joshua was his main military guy. The main religious guy the guy that would be in charge of all the religious aspects of it, the worship, the spiritual life of the people, was his brother Aaron. Under them, so you had Moses, these two, under them you had 70 elders, which we heard about, and those 70 elders would help care for the 2.5 million people. Now, what we see here is that um, this nation of Israel, these Israelites were different than any other nation. They were different from the Egyptians. They were different from the Canaanites in that God led them. God was their leader. God had a special relationship with them. God provided for these Israelites in a special way that he did for no other country. God protected and provided for these people in a special way that he did for no other country, not the Canaanites, not the Egyptians, all because of one fact, and that is the Savior, the Messiah, Jesus would be an Israelite. He would come from this tribe. And so God made sure that this nation was tight and close and cared for and protected so that someday the Savior could come and to come for you. Okay, and so when we pick up our text today, we see that the Israelites now are ready for a transition. Uh, it's ready for a transition because... Um, God is getting them ready to now self-govern and getting them ready to take care of themselves. And so what God does, as we read in Exodus 24, he says, bring the leaders up, bring some of the leaders up. I'm going to start telling you things about me. I'm going to start telling you my thoughts and my actions. I'm going to tell you how you were created. I'm going to tell you what I expect. I'm going to tell you about your Savior. I'm going to tell you all about this stuff. 
I'm going to have you come up, I'm going to have you record it, and then you can go and start governing yourselves. You'll be able to study my words. You'll be able to learn more about me. And that's where we're picking up our text, because here we have God, the same God that led them out of slavery, the same God that led them through the Red Sea, the same God that has been providing for them. He is getting them ready now to take over the Canaanite land. And the best way I picture it, and the best way maybe you can picture it is, um, have you guys, has anybody ever been to the Dominican Republic here? Dominican Republic? Okay. Dominican Republic um, doesn't have a lot of stuff, right? Not a lot of resources besides tourism. They have no navy. They have no army. That's about the size of the Israelites, okay? And what God is saying is you're about to go into Canaanite and you're about to conquer it. The Canaanites, well, they're the United States. They have the sophisticated army. They have the sophisticated navy. They have forgotten more about military than these Israelites know. And you, Dominican Republic, are going to attack the United States and you're going to conquer it. For these Israelites, uh, this is no small thing. But it is a small thing because God is on their side. This is where God wants them to be. And so with it, God says, it's time for me to teach you things and record things and get you to trust in what you're about to do. That's where we are going to pick up our, our text, our chapter 24, because this is what we saw. Moses then, as we saw, wrote down everything that the Lord had said. So God records for them the Ten Commandments, the, the um, early books. He records all these things for them. And then what happened? Moses, in verse 18, Moses entered the cloud, and as he went up into the mountain, he stayed in the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. And he was asking the Israelites to trust that when I come down, I'm ready to take you and lead you. God is ready to take you and lead you when I come down. Now trust, that's what we're focusing on today. Trust is a very valuable thing. You've probably heard some sayings about trust, right? Uh, trust is something that you can't buy. Uh, trust is something that once you lose it, it is very hard to get back. If, if you have a pen nearby, or if you want to just mentally do this, let's, let's go through a little trust exercise. Um, on a scale of 1 to 10, and we'll put down, or we'll put down 0 to 10, after hearing some of these things, you might understand why. Um, on a scale of 0, meaning I do not trust them or this at all, to 10, I entrust them explicitly. There is no chinks in my trust armor. Would you say, on a scale of 0 to 10, you trust the media in the United States? In your mind, do you have a trust? What's your number? Between 0 or is it up towards 10? The media. Okay? What about our government? Do you trust our government? 0 to 1 to 10, what would your number be? If you feel like writing it down, write it down. How about a family member? Maybe the person that you drove here with. Do you trust them? How much do you trust them? Five, six, seven? What about the person on the other side of the room here? How much do you trust them? I can assume that they're Christians, probably members of Hope, probably members of the family here, uh, probably, uh, you know, pray for you. How much do you trust them? What's, what's your number there? How much do you trust me? As a pastor, looking at some of my family, that, that might be a number... But as a pastor, how much do you trust me? How much do you trust what I say? Finally, and this is the number that I want you to write down in your mind uh, and circle it, how much do you trust God? And be honest. Maybe you don't want to write that down. How much do you trust God, really? Carry that number with you. The other numbers you don't have to memorize or think, but I want you to carry that number of how much you trust God with you because now we're going to go into our text. Because as you're going to see, um, the Israelites, remember what is happening. They're allowed to approach the mountain. A bunch of them are able to go up, and only Moses and uh, a, few, a couple others are able to go up and have a conversation with God as they record God's words. And now it's been about 40 days and 40 nights, and this is what happens. It's recorded, when the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron, Moses' brother. Remember what's Aaron's job? He is the spiritual leader. He is the, he is the one. He's their pastor. He's the one that his job, 
We'll take care of hunting. We'll take care of everything. We'll, we'll provide for you. You know God as best you can and teach God his timeless truths to us. That's your job, Aaron. Okay. Um, they gathered around Aaron and they said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. So it's been 40 days and 40 nights. We got to see that it only took uh, them 40 days and 40 nights, but they didn't know that. We get the ability to see that it was recorded that he was up there 40 days and 40 nights, 38th, 39th, 40th, time to go. But they didn't know. And so because they didn't know, they thought that God had forgotten them, that they had lost all trust in what God was promising. All that trust that they had in God that we read before in uh, chapter 24, it's all fizzled. It has all gone away. So much so that they, now they have abandoned God. Now they don't even think about what God wants or what God has taught. They don't have any of that anymore. And now of all the people who should have known better, who would it have been? It would have been Aaron, right? Aaron is that firewall. Aaron is that stopper that says, wait a second, time to teach. Okay, just because God is not answering as quickly as you want doesn't mean you don't lose trust in him. Just because God is not answering the way that you, uh, as long as you want, as quickly as you want, the way that you want, doesn't mean you abandon him. That's when you trust him even more. But what happens? Verse 2. Aaron answered them, Well, let's do this. Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing, and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed them and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a, of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Uh, you can imagine how many earrings it must take to make an idol. Uh, you pictured about three feet, three feet across, how much gold that must take. You can see how much the Lord has blessed them. Bless them with gold, so much gold that if they collected it just from some of the people, they're able to make all of this. So you see the Lord not only protecting them, but caring for them and giving them abundance. And yet, this is what they do. Then they said, These are our gods, O Israel, who brought us up out of Egypt. So long gone is the, the fact that God is the one that brought them out. Long gone is the faith and the trust that they had in their Lord. Long gone. It is all fizzled away simply because God took too long in answering them, they thought. Verse 5. Well, when Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day, so this has been going on for multiple days now. This isn't just something that uh, Aaron gets into in a whim and a half hour later, he comes to his senses and shakes it off and says, okay, wait, wait a second. Whoa, 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 whoa. This is getting too far. This has become a multiple day thing. He is now entirely invested in the idol worshiping here. So the next day, the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterwards, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. So now this is a huge party, so everyone can see. So all the nations that might be peeking in, can see what they're doing and where their strength lies. Well, God knows it too. Look at what God says to Moses, verse 7. Then the Lord said to Moses, as he is teaching them, all of a sudden you, you almost have the feeling, teaching you this, teaching you this, all right, stop. we got to stop. You need to go down because your people, not my people, he doesn't call them my people, your people, these are how I feel about people that disobey me. This is how angry I am when people sin against me and when they trust in other things. Because your people, whom you brought up out of Egypt, they've become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I have commanded them and made themselves into an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. I wonder what you're thinking right now. This, I don't know about, this is getting a little painful, isn't it? It's getting a little painful to watch, to see how this is just falling down so quickly. These are not just uninformed people. This is Aaron leading them and doing this and people doing this 
40 days ago, they were interacting with God. They were eating with God and drinking with God himself. And now how quickly that trust has faded. And I'm not going to speak for you. Make no mistake, I would probably be there too. I would probably be there, and I'm betting you would too. Because we write down how our trust is in with the Lord. You have a number in mind. But once we get outside those doors, and once this world comes around us, how quickly it is for us to have that trust fade away. How quickly it is, it is for us to wonder, or, or to, to, to praise the things that we can do, to praise the work of our hands, to praise the education that we had that got our jobs, to praise the things and the, the thoughts that we have and the choices that we have made. How easy it, us, it is for us to say, I have done these things instead of the Lord. Or when we go to the Lord and we speak to him in prayer, we talk to him about the things that we want, he doesn't answer in 20 seconds, well, maybe he didn't hear me. Maybe he's not listening to me. Maybe he's not as powerful as I thought. Let's just take a look at the, this whole coronavirus. This whole coronavirus thing that's going around. You are hearing everyone, everyone talk about this doom, helplessness. Um, there are people that are thinking that they are, there's nothing that they can do. Nowhere have I heard from anyone, and I'm not, I'm not accusing you, nowhere have I heard anyone say, you know what, my Lord is more powerful than disease. I just heard about that a couple weeks ago. He's the one that's in charge of it. He's the one that is more powerful than that, and he is, is in control of this situation. My Lord has promised to take care of me, that nothing is going to happen to me apart from his will. No, I'm not saying not to take steps in that store, but how quickly even our attitudes, nowhere do we even say those things. When it's cancer, what do we usually say? We, leave, we lose this person to cancer instead of trusting that God had this for a purpose. If we lose our job this year, we think to ourselves, where's God when I need him most? Instead of trusting in him. I bring this up to bring up the fact that we would probably be there too because our trust fades just like the snow is fading right before our eyes, when things go, don't go exactly the right way, our trust in the Lord fades as well. And so God has every right to say what he says in verse 9 and 10. So he says, I have seen these people, the Lord says to Moses, and he very well could say to us, I have seen you, Dan. I have seen each one of us. They are very stiff-necked people, very stubborn, Right? They won't bow to the Lord, stiff-necked. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and I may destroy them. God would have every right to talk to us like that, wouldn't he? Because we might put down that I trust in God as a 10, but if we're honest, it is less than a 10. And anything less than a 10, according to God, disqualifies us from being with him forever. But here's the amazing part. Here is the amazing part, and this is what we call a type. This is typology. I'll talk about it in a second. Look at this amazing part, verse 11. But Moses steps up. He stands in the middle. He stands in front of God. He sought the favor of the Lord his God. He knew God's thoughts because God uh, mentioned them, and he stands between the people and God. And look at what he says. He says, O Lord, why should your anger burn against your people? whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand. Why should the Egyptians, why, those people that are watching this, why should they say it is with evil intent that he brought them out just to kill them uh, in the mountains and wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce anger, Lord. Relent and do not bring disaster upon your people. Instead, Lord, Moses says, remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, Israel, to whom you swore by your own self that you promised that you will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give your descendants all this land I have promised them, and it will be, your, it will be their inheritance forever. So, Lord, remember your promises. Remember your teaching to us about grace. Remember when you told us, Lord, that even though we sin, your grace is always bigger. Remember the fact that you're going to bring a Savior to pay for our sins, even these sins. Remember that you have a rescue plan. Don't abandon that rescue plan. 
Remember your grace. Remember your mercy. That's what makes you different from any other God, any other religion, any other thought. The fact that you always go to grace first, second, and third. That you are always quick to forgive no matter what. That makes you different. And then look at what happens. Verse 14, Then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster that, had, that he had threatened. I call this a, a type of Christ. This is what they call a fancy word, typology. And what typology is, is when you see people in the Bible doing things that make you, that remind you of Jesus. And here, you see Moses being a little Jesus. He is doing things that Jesus did, but on a much bigger and a much more important level. What do you see Moses doing here? You seeing him saying, you know what, you have every right to go out against these people, but Lord, stop. Find another way. Find another way so that you do not bring the calamity upon these people like they deserve. Don't punish them. Do not punish them. Instead, find a different way. And what Moses is doing is what Jesus will be doing much later down the road. Jesus is the one that said, Lord, punish me instead of you. Punish me instead of them. Let me go to the cross, beat me with the blows, so that you only have love for your people, no matter what they do, no matter when they do it. First Timothy tells us this uh, in a better way than I could ever say. First Timothy says, There is one God, one mediator, mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all men, the testimony given in its proper time. Let's just read that, but a little, little slower. For there is one God, and that's what we have seen throughout this whole time. There's only one God that could do this. There's only one God that could do the miraculous, like we just got done studying. But we get to know that God. He shows himself to us. There is one God, one mediator between God and man, one person that is willing to stand between us and the fury and the punishment that is due to us, and his name is the man Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one that became man. He's the one that became man to live like you and I do, so that he could live a perfect life, so that he could be punished for our imperfection. But in the end, he was the one that gave himself as a ransom for all men, and the testimony given in his proper time. That is our source of trust, no matter what is going on in our life. As we leave here, we'll be leaving those doors, getting back into the world. And we're going to be asked to trust in many things. You're going to be asked to trust in your checkbook. You're going to be asked to trust in your healthy living. You're going to be asked to trust in your plans <laughs> and your schedule for this coming week. You're going to be asked to trust that you did things great so that God will accept you into heaven. But we trust in what God tells us. We trust in God's timeless truths. His timeless truths that say, you know what? Let me handle disease, because I'm the one that is bigger than disease. He's the one that says, you know what? How about if you trust me with your checkbook? How about if you trust me in what I have given to you? How about you trust me when it comes to this coming week? Because you see all the things I've done in the past, I think you can trust me with the things going on in your life. And finally, when it comes to our death, trust me, because I have an answer. My answer is my son coming down to live for you, so that we get to spend eternity forever. Let's go to our Lord and let's speak to him in uh, prayer. Lord of heaven, you put up with so much from us, our rebellion, our lack of trust, our self-centeredness. That's why hearing that Jesus was willing to come and save us is such a sweet message, because you should have and could have rightfully abandoned us. But Lord, today we are thankful for your grace and love, we're also thankful that you are willing to do this and not base it on what we can or cannot do. Give us now opportunities to reflect your joy and your grace to others in our mission fields. Amen.